have with us an auteur, a gifted storyteller, visionary cultural powerhouse, and a filmmaker whose stories showcase the urgent, necessary, yet often willfully ignored aspects of Black life in America. Whether it was your moving and inspiring story of Dr. Martin Luther King's march for the voting rights for Black Americans in Selma, or the incisive and brilliant portrayal of the lives of the five Harlem teenagers falsely convicted of a horrific attack on a white female Central Park jogger in When They See Us, or your precise and analytical dissection of the brutal racial injustice of the American criminal justice system in 13. Your stories not only speak truth to power, but have also been responsible for seismic cultural shifts that have changed how the world understands race and oppression. And now you're back with Origin, a movie that has audaciously reinvented what ideas can look like on screen and has been called a masterful narrativization of the best-selling book by journalist and historian Isabel Wilkerson, Cast. Origin, as our viewers might already know, is among the first American films to depict the struggle of Dalit people in India against caste, and it does so with incredible beauty, if I may add. Eva, thank you again for joining us. Your film origin has a lyrical, haunting quality that lingers onto the mind long after people have seen it. Mm -hmm. I've seen it twice, and both times the theater was filled with the sounds of people openly crying throughout the length of the film. But showcasing the pain of marginalized people on screen is a delicate act. You want to honor the suffering without opening it to the criticism of being too emotional, especially from people who have never experienced that pain. How did you achieve that balance? Uh, well, thank you for the warm words and the beautiful introduction. I really appreciate the time that it took to do that and the intention. And I think, you know, I, I, I'll just say I can't concern myself with that balance. You know, I have to tell the truth as I see it. And I have to work within a space that allows me to fully express the story that I'm charged to tell. And so I can't negotiate every day as to what's gonna make someone who's not me happy, because that's not a way to do anything, right? Yeah. I have to be true to myself and whatever my calling is to tell the story in the way that I think is best. And then certainly the way that I think is best is one that is sensitive to, um, to the subject of the story, uh, making sure that I am in contact with the real people involved with the story or their descendants, uh, making sure that I'm trying to be as well researched if I am rendering stories about things that I don't know firsthand. Uh, in particular, you know, as much research as I could consume in the time that I, ha that I had about Dalit culture and Dalit people, Dalit issues which are not a monolith, all Dalit people. That was a big thing for me. I always say to, to white folks about black people, we're not all the same. We don't all think the same way. We're not a monolith. Absolutely. And yet I was falling into that as I would talk to one Dalit person and be like, great, I got it. <laughs> and then I talked to another person and they would disagree and be like, right, people are people and individuals have different, you know. And so really trying to learn as best I can and be responsible, um, but ultimately, as an artist, you can only be responsible to yourself when you're telling the story. So I gather all that information and then I just let my conscience guide me. Yeah, no, thank you for mentioning the research that and the time that you took to explore India's caste issues, because it really shows. You know, oh. you've showcased India's caste system with a loving tenderness and warmth and almost a sort of reverence. That is Dalit people we've never seen on screen anywhere, whether it is in India or United States. Oh. I'm, I'm somebody who comes from the exact cast of manual scavengers that mm. you've shown on screen. Mm. And I still have relatives who engage with that kind of dehumanizing work. Mm. So I want to personally thank you for mm. elevating our pain to a place that's worthy of respect. Mm. That you so also me. Thank you very much. Of course. And I, I really feel that I couldn't move from my seat for the for 10 minutes after the movie was over because it was such an incredible experience to see your life story depicted on screen with a sense of respect and warmth, which we just never get to see. Mm. But like you said, 
that you know you were not as familiar with India's caste system before reading the book. Since of course, you know, purpose of caste is to be invisible, is so that people outside the country don't talk about it, don't know about it. So how did you approach these sections, especially during your filmmaking process? You've talked about how there wasn't enough time and you were on a very tight schedule. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yes, well, your words mean so much to me. I was very nervous about doing it. I regarded the work of telling the story um, of the connections between um, the, the, the Dalit people and black people in America um, with a lot of fear that I was going to get it wrong. And also in the same way that we might squint at entrusting African-American stories to people who are not African-American, it's something that we had to do as black people in this country in the early days of the movie industry, because you know no one else was really allowed to make movies. Um, the, I would question, why am I, I'm not the person to tell this story, but I understood that this was a part of a larger story and that, you know, I'm trying to show connective tissue and that there will be Dalit filmmakers who will take it and run with this. This is a primer, it's a base to familiarize people. So I embraced that idea and then I just started to really research, talk to folks both in India and around the Dalit diaspora. Um, really made sure that I was uh, drilling different ages of people, different kinds of people, different professions of people, uh, second generation folks who, Dalit people who in uh, young right now uh, in the United States who may not have as uh, intense an understanding of the day-to-day -day repercussions as, you know, their, their forebears and their, and their elders. And just trying to take in as much as possible uh, Dr. Suraj Yenge was a, a huge, huge uh, help. Um, and then along the way, um, there were pockets of people who, uh, who just stepped up and said, I will give you this information. Did you know about this? Um, what I'll say is there's an, such an overwhelming warmth and support that I felt. Everywhere I go when I was speaking with a Dalit person, I felt embraced. I felt championed, people cheering me on. I would say, I don't think I'm the one to do it. They were like, just go do it. Just <laughs> stop talking and go do it. Okay, you know what I mean? There was none of that. And um, and so, you know, I, 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 I at some point just said, okay, you know, I'm gonna do my best. Um, I, I loved meeting with Dalit scholars and, uh, and being schooled, uh, learning about the history and contemporary history, cases that were happening right now in the last five years, feudal India and what has been happening for ages. Uh, it was just such an eye-opening thing. And I, and I think what I'll say is Americans know nothing about it, J just nothing. Uh, we know that there's a caste system in India, but the depths of the degradation and the dehumanization is not fully known. I think our film barely scratches the surface but hopefully it allows people to be interested. I'll just say this, at the end of screenings, when I talk to folks, the uh, scene of the, the, the men engaged with manual scavenging is such an eye opener to American audiences that, and they're in such a heart, heartbroken place about it, that people ask me, is that real? Mm. Is that real? Is that now? Are you sure? This can't be. And if the film does anything, if it just opens people up to, yes, this is real, and yes, this is happening now, then I think that's a positive thing. Millennia ago, Dalits were called the untouchables of India. Enforced into the degrading work of manual scavenging the practice of cleaning excrement from toilets and open drains by hand in exchange for leftover food. The only thing that they have to protect their bodies is oil, each other, and their prayers. No, thank you for specifically focusing on that, 
because it is a scene that stays with everybody, including myself. And, you know, it's been talked about. I've, as part of my research for this interview today, I was listening to your conversations and many people want to ask you about this particular scene when we have these two Dalit men who are manual scavengers enter what is clearly, and there is no polite way to say it, they enter a tank filled with human excrement, human shit. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who are from that community, this is part of our life's reality. We know that exists. Mm -hmm. But to an average Western movie goer, these scenes might also bring to mind another film that dealt with a similar theme, but in a completely different context. I'm talking about British filmmaker Danny Boyle's 2008 film, Slumdog Millionaire. Mm -hmm. It opens with a scene that is famous where the child protagonist dives into a pool of human excrement to extract a photo of his favorite movie star. In origin also, we see Miss Wilkerson's character take an auto to her hotel, which seems to be located in a budget traveler friendly neighborhood in New Delhi, a place that some have said, arguably a Pulitzer Prize winning American journalist might not choose to stay at. So I wanna ask you, were you worried about the pitfalls of falling into exoticizing India the way many Western, Western filmmakers have done in the past? Yes, yes, I definitely, um, I definitely wanted to be as cognizant, aware of, of those pitfalls. And yet I also wanted to lean into the stories that Isabel Wilkerson told me. You know, she talked to me about trying to cross a, a street with, it looked like the cars were coming from six or seven directions. Um, so when I went to Delhi, that was happening in areas that were not where the fancy tourist hotels were. She told me a story about walking out of where she was staying directly across from the street that she had to negotiate. Um, she talked about being picked up from the airport uh, by, you know, by a, 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 a sweet man, you know, kind of um, uh, who, who uh, you know, gave her a lovely smile. Um, trying as much as possible to stay true to the stories that she told me. Um, and so that's how I rendered them. Now, later someone said, well, she would be at a fancy hotel. But the interesting thing is I think folks forget um, that uh, writing in the United States may not be as lucrative as folks think. And, I know. <laughs> and that, and that um, you know, writers and artists you know, if you're not um, a superstar, you know, uh, get paid every few years and have to stretch things. And writing a book about cast is not a lucrative hot topic. Um, so I think some of the assumptions about who she is and how she lives, like someone said to me the other day, she's carrying a Louis Vuitton bag, you know? And I was like, I carry a knockoff Louis Vuitton bag that costs $25 on the street. Like, you never know what someone's life is like. And mm -hmm. so I think those criticisms are valid or those questions are valid, but certainly it, it, it was less about exoticizing India because I don't think it's possible. There's no place you can put a camera in India from the airport to the most beautiful hotel to you know any street and not find beauty to me in the faces of the people, in the, in, the, in the colors. I've never seen so much color in buildings, in clothes, in cars, in, it's just, it's sometimes I go to New York and I was like, wow, New York feels like black and white and India feels like a, a film in color. Feel like I'm in the Wizard of Oz all of a sudden. It's just so electric with energy and life. And so that's what we wanted to capture. And, um, and so, yeah, I accept any, any criticism, any, any thoughts that people have about it. And, and just want people to engage with it. You know, we don't have to agree, um, but we have to do our best. And that's what I did. No, I think that truly shows in the film. And, you know, speaking of criticism, Wilkerson's book Cast has been a game changing book. It has shifted the needle, not just for racial justice, but also caste rights in America. We have this entire conversation that is now pushed into the mainstream thanks to, thanks to Ms. Wilkerson's book. But at the same time, the book has also received criticism from the community. And I have to be honest and upfront and say, including myself, mm -hmm. where folks felt that India's caste was used as an allegory in its own narrative. 
and did not receive the same attention that America's white supremacy and Nazi Germany have arguably received. However, yeah. in the movie, you seem to have heard that criticism and expanded mm -hmm. the space for Dalit narratives. You worked with Dalit academics, including Suraj, Dr. Suraj Yengre, who portrays himself in the film, and Dr. Gaurav Patania, who is also known to many of us, who plays the role of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Tell us about why you made that choice. Well, I, I had heard those criticisms. And I, I think also, as I read the book, I was interested in knowing more and, you know, was searching for more in the book. And, and so, as I did with many of the stories in the book, I would find the seed and then I would research further and put that research of the things that were interesting to me in the movie. But certainly, I think, you know, one of the things that I had tried to do in the movie was to show a, a wide range of the Dalit experience. So I wanted to show the history of, of Dr. Mbedkar uh, in his early years, throughout his, his, his journey, um, uh, kind of a, a little mini biopic in the movie on him. I wanted to hear from Dalit journalists, uh, Dalit scholars. I wanted to make sure that every single person who was portraying a Dalit on screen was an actual Dalit person that it uh, these you know wasn't being portrayed by other casts in a way that was inauthentic that took some doing to find um, but with the help of a lot of people were able to get that done um, I feel that uh, I, I wanted to fill in the gaps of some of my own questions about the adult experience that I had from the book and I'm grateful to Isabel for opening the door so that I even had had a place to go with the questions. Um, you know, Suraj was just instrumental and Godov was like a, I, I can't tell you how helpful he was beyond, I mean, I'm asking you to portray Dr. M. Becker, like not an easy task, <laughs> but to do that, I said, you need to, you need to eat, keep eating. You know what I mean? You need to, <laughs> You need to, you know, you, you, you gotta, oh, you gotta God. be, you gotta be a giant. You have to be a giant. You have to be the hero. And, um, but even I making sure I said, you know, in the scenes where Dr. Becker comes, uh, onto the shore and he's greeting people, um, uh, as he returns back to India, all of those people need to be Dalit people. And I'm in Savannah, Georgia. When I shoot that Gaurav help me find Dalit people. And he, mm. people were driving from states around just to be there, to stand there, because the story meant so much to them. And the fact that that rep rep representation was accurate meant a lot to me. Um, they were teaching me the right way to say uh, um, different phrases. Um, they would, would laugh at me and then pat me on the back and say, try again. Um, and, um, you know, gifts and books and just trying to educate me. So a long way to say, um, there was a lot of intention put into it. Uh, and, um, that was a positive intention. And again, perfect. No comprehensive. No, um, a, an honest attempt, um, is, is what, is what I gave. I think that absolutely shows through. And I'm so glad that, again, you mentioned that particular scene where we have Dr. Ambedkar walking on the shore and have all these Dalit people, and you can see the bond that they have. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I do want to talk about my last question about Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. You know, he is an iconoclastic leader of Dalit rights, statesman. He made sure we got an equal seat at the proverbial table in India. But while Gandhi has a massive recognition for his ideas in the West, Origin is the first introduction for many people to this figure who means so much to our community. And it took a Black woman like yourself, a Black woman filmmaker, to introduce Ambedkar to the world in a way that no other white or even dominant cast Indian filmmaker has been able to do. Mm -hmm. I just want your closing thoughts on the solidarity between the Dalit and the Black movements in terms of a shared struggle and shared oppression. Well, I think that the solidarity is one that would be so strong if more of us knew about each other and had a connected, a connected, a bridge to our histories. To be honest, I have a degree in African American history. Um, I uh, read so much. I'm very, very interested in, in world history. 
I did a whole film about Dr. King called Selma. I knew that he'd gone to India, but I'd never listened to the speeches or read what he said about that trip. So I have no context about those shared struggles. You know, I never knew that Dr. Becker and Becker even existed. How is it possible? Such a renowned freedom fighter, such a, 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 a champion of, of justice. How, how can I, someone who regards myself as very connected to those struggles of people around the world, not even be aware of his name? It angered me. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, to know that he was in correspondence, you know, in his, in his younger years with African American leaders saying mm -hmm. to them, I see what you're doing. Do you see what I'm doing? Let's get to, I mean, this is intentional correspondence and connection that's been lost to us. Mm -hmm. When I, when I read about, about these black leaders, I do not hear about these connections. So it must happen and that solidarity must be there uh, mm -hmm. and it can only be there if there's an awareness. And so hopefully if nothing else, this at least starts to make people who had never considered each other in that way, think more about, wait, I have a connection and uh, hopefully opens the door to more, to more thinking about it. I'll just say one of the things that was so kind of awe-inspiring to me was learning about Dr. Invedker more than a leader. Regarded as more, I try to share with some black folk who he is to so many of the people who I spoke with, and I couldn't even find a comparable person in the United States. Someone had said, Oh, he's like our Dr. King. I said, No, he's like our Dr. King times a hundred. It, 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 it is the way, the way people, I can cry right now, their eyes, it's a reverence. It's a reverence that it, you can't even explain and there's nothing I can compare it to in the modern context. And uh, I don't think the film, I, I did not even know how to fully wrap my mind around that visually. I hope someone one day does the story. This is the story that I would pitch to a great Dalit filmmaker. It's the story of why the West has embraced Gandhi and rejected, ignored, and not highlighted Dr. Becker. And as I hear it, pretty juicy story, right? Mm -hmm. The way, the way you've got this young upstart doctor, but you know, you've got this, he has his, he would speak up. He's yeah. going to say how he feels always Absolutely. defending. And he's untouchable. And, and he's untouchable. What a, I mean, what a, what a, what a hero. So Absolutely. I think that, and he's young and he's, and he's untouched and he's, you know, I, I just think, wow, I want to see that movie. So I hope someone makes it. And at least when that movie is made, some people on, in America will say, oh, I know, I know, I know a bit about this. So consider this the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ava. I really appreciate that. Putting that out in the world, filmmakers who are listening, Dalit folks, let's make that movie. But thank you so much, Ava. I hope so. Yeah, I look forward to talking to you again. I hope we get a chance to, to meet and spend some time. Thank you for this. Thank you so much. I'm really honored. And hopefully, I know everybody who listens to this will be so excited. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Well, Origins in Theater, so find it where you can. Yes, I forgot to mention that it was on my agenda. Please find the, move, find the movie theater where Origins is playing and go out and see it. We will have the dates for an India release maybe soon. But for those who are outside India, watch the film. It is necessary. It's urgent. It's crucial. And it's a masterpiece. No, thank you so much, my friend. Good to talk with you. Lovely talking to you. Bye-bye. Thank you.